society. Daniel Bell, professor of sociology at Harvard University, is the author of The End of Ideology and The Coming of the Post-Industrial Society. Professor Bell was recently in Israel as keynote speaker at a symposium on ethics and technology at the Technicon in Haifa. It was during his stay in Israel that he recorded tonight's talk. Professor Bell reflects on the distinctions between pre-industrial, industrial industrial, and post-industrial societies and on what he calls the characteristic mode of attachment to each, namely religion, work and culture. He argues that as the inadequacies of post-industrial culture make themselves felt, our own age may well see a revival of religion. Much of the character of men and the pattern of their social relations is shaped by the kind of work they do. Cain was a tiller of the soil, Abel a keeper of sheep, Esau a hunter, Jacob tended the flocks. If work divides the character of men, it also divides the character of societies. And we can speak of pre-industrial, industrial, industrial, and post-industrial societies. Life in pre-industrial societies, which is still the condition of most of the world today, is what I would call primarily a game against nature. The labor force is overwhelmingly in agriculture, mining, fishing, forestry. A man works with raw muscle power in inherited ways, and his sense of the world is conditioned by the vicissitudes of the elements the seasons, the storms, the fertility of the soil, the amount of water, the depth of the mine seams, the droughts and the floods. The rhythms of life are shaped by such contingencies. The pace of work varies with the seasons and the weather. Industrial societies, those which produce goods, play what I call a game against fabricated nature. It is a game against machinery in which man is hitched to a machine. The world has become technical and rationalized. The machine predominates, and the rhythms of life mechanically paced. Time is chronological, mechanical, evenly spaced by the divisions of the clock. Energy has replaced raw muscle and provides the basis for the large leaps in productivity, that is, the mass output of standardized goods which characterizes an industrial society. Energy and machines transform the nature of work. Yet it is also a world of scheduling and programming in which the components, men and materials, are brought together at exact instances for assembly. It is a world of coordination in which these men, materials, and markets are dovetailed for the production and distribution of goods. It is a world of hierarchy and bureaucracy in which men are treated as things because one can more easily coordinate things than men and men become reduced to roles rather than simply being persons, and this distinction becomes formalized in the tables of an enterprise. A post-industrial society is vastly different from the other two. It centers on services, human services, professional and technical services, that is the areas of health, education, the services which involve technical knowledge such as computer programming, management and the like. And as such, it is a game between persons. The organization of a research team, the relation between doctor and patient, teacher and pupil, government official and practitioner, and the post-industrial society is also a communal society in which the social unit is the community organization rather than the individual. And the decisions have to be reached through some polity in private organizations as well as government rather than the market. But cooperation between men is much more difficult, as we know, than the management of things. Participation is a condition of community, and when many different groups want too many different things, and they're not prepared to bargain, then one simply has increased conflict or deadlock. There is either a politics of consensus or a politics of stymie. Yet such changes in social organization may in some intangible way herald more a change in consciousness and cosmology 
the dark tinge of which has always been present at the edge of man's conception of himself in the world, and which may now move to the phenomenological center. In existentialist terminology, man is thrown into the world, confronting alien and hostile powers which he has sought to understand and master. The first confrontation was with nature, and for most of the thousands of years of man's existence, life has been a game against nature. To find a strategy which keeps nature at bay, to find shelter from the elements, to ride the waters and the wind, to wrest food and sustenance from the soil and from the waters and from other creatures. The coding of much of men's behavior has been shaped by the need to adapt to these vicissitudes. However, man as Homo Faber has sought to make things, and in making things he has dreamt of reworking nature. To be dependent on nature was to bend to its caprices. To remake nature through fabrication and replication is to enhance man's powers. To that extent, the Industrial Revolution at bottom was an effort to substitute a technical order for the natural order, an engineering conception of function and rationality for the haphazard ecological distribution of resources and climate. The post-industrial order turns its back on both. In the salient experience of work, men live more and more outside nature and less and less with machinery and things. They live with and encounter only one another. Now the problems of group life are of course of the oldest difficulties of human civilization, going back to the cave and the clan. But now the context has changed. The oldest forms of group life were within the context of nature, and the overcoming of nature gave an external common purpose to the lives of men. The group life that was hitched to things, the life of an industrial age, gave men a huge sense of power as they created mechanical artifacts that transformed the world. But in the post-industrial world, for the majority of persons who live in such an age, all the context would have disappeared from view. In the daily round of work, the elements which shape character, men no longer confront nature, either as alien or beneficent, and few handle artifacts and things. Will this changing experience create a change in consciousness and sensibility? For most of human history, reality was nature. And in poetry and imagination, men sought to relate themselves to that natural world. In the last 150 years, reality became techniques, tools and things made by men, yet given an independent existence outside men in a reified world. But now reality is becoming only the social world, excluding nature and things, and experienced primarily through the reciprocal consciousness of others, rather than some external reality. Society thus becomes increasingly a web of consciousness, a form of imagination to be realized as a social construction. But with what rules? And with what moral conceptions? Now, for the three settings that I've sketched, one can also discern three modes of attachment or modes of identities by which individuals have sought to relate themselves to the world. And these would be religion, work, and culture. The traditional mode, of course, was religion, as a trans-mundane means of understanding oneself, one's people, one's history, and one's place in the scheme of things. In the development of modern society, a process sometimes called secularization, the social world of religion shrank, and more and more religion became a personal belief to be adopted or rejected, not as fate, but as a matter of will, rational or otherwise. That mode of attachment then becomes ethical and aesthetic, and not itself deeply religious and involving a theodicy. And inevitably, such attachment becomes thin and attenuated. Work, as a calling or vocation, was a translation of religion into a this-worldly attachment, a proof through personal effort of one's own goodness and worth. 
the Puritan or the Kibbutznik wanted to work in a calling. Most men, however, today, most of us, are simply forced to work, or the character of work has become routinized and diminished. For the modern, cosmopolitan man, culture replaced religion and work as a means of self-fulfillment or justification, an aesthetic justification of life. But behind this change, essentially from religion to culture, lies, I would argue, an extraordinary turn in consciousness, particularly in the meanings of expressive conduct in human society. In the history of Western society, there has always been a dialectic of release and restraint. The idea of release goes back to Dionysian festivals, Bacchanalian revels, Saturnalias, the Gnostic sects, the first and second centuries, and the subterranean threads unraveled since, or in the biblical legend and history to Sodom and Gomorrah or the Babylonian episodes. The great historic religions of the West, particularly the Old Testament, have been religions of restraint. We find in these great historic religions a fear of human nature unchecked, an association of release with lust, with sexual competitiveness, violence, and murder. The fear is the fear of the demonic, the frenzied ecstasy, or the ecstasis, of leaving one's body and crossing the boundaries of sin. Now, in Western society, religion has had two functions. It has guarded the portals of the demonic, seeking to diffuse it by expressing it in emblematic terms, whether it be the symbolic sacrifice acted out in the Akedah of Abraham and Isaac, or the ritual sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which becomes transubstantiated in the way from the wine as the flesh and blood of Christ. And secondly, religion has provided a continuity with the past. Prophecy has always been located in the past and becomes the basis of denying the validity of antinomian progressive revelation. Culture, which was subordinated to religion, judged the present on the basis of the past and provided a continuity of both through tradition. And in these two ways, I would say, religion has undergirded almost all of historic Western culture. Now, the crossover I speak about occurs with the breakup of the theological authority of religion in the middle of the 19th century. The culture, particularly the emergent current we now call modernism, took over the relation with the demonic. But instead of taming it, as religion sought to do, modernist culture began to accept the demonic, to explore it, to revel in it. But there were also, I think, two consequences. Religion always imposed moral norms on culture. It insisted on limits, particularly the subordination of aesthetic impulses, of pure sensations. Once culture began to take over the dealing with the demonic, there arose the demand for the autonomy of the aesthetic, the idea that experience in and of itself is of supreme value. Everything is to be explored, anything is to be permitted, at least to the imagination, including lust, murder, and other themes which have dominated the modernist surreal. The second aspect was to root all judgment, all authority, all justification in the demands of the I, of the imperial self. By turning one's back on the past, one shreds the ties which compel continuity and makes the new and the novel the source of interest and the curiosity of the self the touchstone of judgment. Thus modernism as a cultural movement trespass religion and move the center of authority from the sacred to the profane. But by and large, these cultural impulses, I would argue, have spent themselves, have become exhausted, have become a form of chic, if one comes back in a more serious way to the problem of what modes of attachment are possible in a world in which nature has been excluded, things have been excluded, work has lost meaning, culture has become empty, in a curious sense, one comes back in an unfashionable way to religion. Religion not as a social projection of man into an external emblem, but a transcendental conception that is outside man, yet relates man to something beyond himself. There is one fundamental point which should give anybody pause in thinking about the present. 
And this is the observation by Max Weber that no known society exists without some conception of experience which we would call religious. What has happened today is essentially the breakup of institutional religion, of older religions in many respects. And when this happens, cults appear. Will all this lead to a new reformation? Analogies are always tempting but deceptive. The reformation, at least if one follows Eric Erickson in his psychological interpretation, was not only an effort to break up corrupt institutions, but the search of the son for the direct relation to the father without mediation of the church. But the new religiosity makes a distinction between the personal faith of men and women and a cumulative historical tradition. The emphasis of the new reformation is on personal experience and personal faith unrelated to the past. Yet can a faith be simply naively created anew without memory? I think that despite the shambles of modern culture, some religious answer surely will be forthcoming. For religion is not a property of society, as Emil Durkheim once thought. It is a constitutive part of man's consciousness, a cognitive search for a pattern of a general order of existence, an affective need to establish rituals and to make such conceptions sacred, a primordial need for relatedness to some others, or to a set of meanings which will establish a transcendent response to the self, and finally the existential need to confront the finalities of suffering and death. Religions at crucial junctures of history are sometimes the most revolutionary of all forces. When traditions and institutions become rigidified and oppressive, or when the discordance of voices and the babble of contradictory beliefs become intolerable, men seek for new answers. And in these circumstances, men look for new prophets. In the past, prophecy broke down ritualistic conservatism, when that conservatism had lost all meaning. And prophecy provided a new gestalt, when there had been too many meanings. The prophet thus confronted both the priest, whose only claim was the authority of the past, and the mystagogue, who derived his power from the manipulation of magic as a means of salvation. But it may be, perhaps, that we are looking in the wrong direction for the signs. For Weber, prophecy was charismatic, since it derived from the personal qualities of the prophet, who was able to draw upon the sources of grace from the extra-mundane world. And such a revolutionary force necessarily had to be charismatic, because the prophets, like Hegel's world historical figures, had to be strong enough in their own persons to break the sanctity of tradition or the cake of custom which encrusted the past. But such a prophet today will be knocking down an open door. Who today defends tradition? And where is the power of the past to hold back any tides of the new? There well may be a double answer. If one of the sources of despair are the existential questions, we can face them perhaps not by looking forward, but by looking back. Human culture is a creation of men, the construction of a world to maintain continuity, to maintain the unanimal life. Animals, seeing others die, do not imagine it of themselves. Men alone know their fate and create rituals not just to ward off mortality, but to maintain a consciousness of kind which is a mediation of fate. In this sense, religion is the awareness of a moment of transcendence, the passage out of the past from which one has come and to which one is bound, to a new conception of the self as a moral agent, freely accepting the past rather than just being shaped by it, and returning to tradition in order to maintain the continuity of moral meanings. To this extent, religion is a redemptive process whereby individuals seek to discharge their obligations that derive from the moral imperatives of their community, the debts in being nurtured, the debts to the institutions that maintain moral awareness. Religion, then, necessarily involves the mutual redemption of fathers and sons. It involves the acknowledgment, in Yeats's phrase, of the blessed who can bless, 
of the laying on of hands and the continuity of generations. Daniel Bell was talking about religion and the post-industrial society. This talk was recorded in Israel recently when he was the key speaker at a symposium at Haifa on ethics and technology. You may be interested in two further broadcasts on philosophical topics that were recently recorded in Israel, Hegel and the Modern World, a discussion between Max Black and Charles Taylor to be broadcast on Radio 3 on Friday, March 21st at 9.20 p.m., and a discussion on the weakness of the will between Stuart Hampshire and Donald Davidson to be broadcast on Sunday, April the 6th at 10.10 p.m.